Good morning and good afternoon to all across the beautiful Canadian and African geographies. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to the Rwanda Investment Session. I'm Gareth Bloor, President of the Canada Africa Chamber of Business, and I'm absolutely honored uh, to introduce our speakers today. Uh, recognizing the attendance of the following VIPs, we have His Excellency Prosper Higiro, High Commissioner of the Republic of Rwanda, DG General, DEC Director General Ian Miles, responsible for Eastern and Southern Africa in the Canadian Government at Global Affairs Canada. Our keynote speaker, Mr. Zephanie Nyonkuru, with us today, First Councillor Igor Marara, High Commissioner at the High Commission of Rwanda, Chair of the Board of the Canada Africa Chamber of Business, Mr. Sebastian Spio Garbra, and Chamber Vice Presidents Susan Namulindwa in Ottawa and Jacques Ndumtumbe, responsible for Africa. It is also a good pleasure to recognize the director of the Canada Africa Chamber of Business also with us today, Mr. Brian Dodo and investors, other members of government and esteemed guests, welcome to the session. It is my great honor to provide the floor now for the opening remarks to the chair of the board of the Canada Africa Chamber of Business based out of Ottawa, who has led billions of dollars in investment facilitation into the continent, Mr. Sebastian Spiogabra. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gareth. Uh, good morning uh, to all of you. And again, uh, thank you for joining us. Um, Jay, Rwanda is, 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 is indeed, um, an amazing country, a resilient country, a uh, country that has endured much tragedy over the last uh, uh, while, and yet has uh, shown the resiliency of the African people. And, um, the, the ability of uh, a focused government um, to really round and to uh, uh, lead uh, people uh, towards, um, you know, greater prosperity and stability. And so it is really a great honor for us all to join uh, His Excellency uh, Higuro and uh, uh, his colleagues from Rwanda to really tell us more about the Rwanda story and how we all can um, help support it. So it's a thing to honor and a great privilege uh, to be here. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, I now have the great uh, pleasure of welcoming His Excellency, High Commissioner of the Republic of Rwanda to Canada, High Commissioner Prosper Higiro. Thank you, Gare, and uh, good morning to everyone. And as a, a, a Rwandan High Commissioner to Canada. Uh, it gives me a uh, great pleasure and actually it's an honor for me to welcome you all to this special, special session that has been dedicated uh, uh, to Rwanda on the post-COVID-19 investment uh, opportunities uh, in Rwanda. Uh, I would like to thank the Canada Africa Chamber of Business for having uh, accepted to partner uh, with the Rwandan High Commission to Canada to organize this meeting. Uh, uh, of course, due to uh, the pandemic, the coronavirus, uh, it had to, to be online, uh, but uh, uh, it has been possible because of the partnership we, 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 we've got from especially, especially uh, uh, Mr. Sebastian Spio Gabra, uh, who has just presented, who is the chair uh, of the board of the chamber, but also we have partnered with uh, Garrett Blow, the president of the chamber. And it's not the first time actually, because last January I had the, the opportunity to address the members uh, of the chamber during the, the, their uh, national uh, or annual assembly. Uh, let me thank also uh, Mr. Ian Miles, uh, the Director General for East and Southern Africa at Global Affairs Canada for his presence today for his support and for his continued collaboration. As we all know, all countries, Rwanda and Canada included, have been seriously affected by the coronavirus pandemic. 
for the last uh, eight to 10 years, to 10 months, sorry. And all countries have been affected both in terms of health and on the socioeconomic dimension. We are organizing this online session intended to give the Canadian business community the required information that can assist them in making investment choices in Rwanda. Because we believe that despite dealing with the pandemic, such as this one, the COVID-19, life has to go on and we need to keep developing our nation and our peoples. I must recognize Mr. Zefanini Omuru, the Deputy CEO of Rwanda Development Board, who will shortly make a presentation on what Rwanda has to offer as in an, an investment destination and the key sectors investors from Canada can tap in. Rwanda and Canada have developed, have developed di diplomatic relations since 1963 and cooperation kept improving in many areas, including education, economic development, international affairs, peacekeeping operations, gender equality, and woman, 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 uh, women empowerment. Through these years, Rwanda and Canada developed trade and investment activities covering various sectors, including agribusiness, mining, renewable energy, etc. I strongly believe that the level of trade between Canada and Rwanda and between Canada and Africa at large need to be upscaled and can surely be improved for the betterment of all parties in the, in, the, in the future. The kind of session we are organizing this today will constitute one of the many ways of getting there. I strongly believe that we need to organize more exchange between our people. And my personal recommendation is that session, that is, is that this session be followed by field visits to understand better opportunities at stake. And at this juncture, I would like to thank you again for your presence and participation, and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency Hiro. It is my great pleasure now to invite Canadian counterpart Director General Ian Miles uh, for his remarks in response to that of our host, His Excellency. And uh, given the investment opportunities to be presented shortly for Canadian businesses representing Global Affairs Canada, Mr. Miles, uh, Dr. Miles and his team will no doubt be available and on hand to assist. And just a note, uh, as we get into the remainder of the session, there will be, be the opportunity at the end to connect directly with the Chamber or others to facilitate further exploration of these investment opportunities. It's my pleasure now to welcome Ian Miles of the Government of Canada at Global Affairs. Thank you very much, Gareth. Uh, thank you, High Commissioner. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, truly a great pleasure uh, to be uh, participating in this morning's event. And on behalf of the Government of Canada, I would like to extend uh, my, my gratitude to the High Commissioner of Rwanda in Canada and the Canada-Africa Chamber of Business uh, for organizing this event. Uh, as Director General of Global Affairs Canada's Eastern and Southern Africa Bureau, I'm delighted to attend um, and to uh, encourage and promote investment opportunities in Rwanda and um, commercial partnerships uh, between our two countries. I think Canada recognizes that Rwanda and other African countries are changing quickly. And we are keen to increase uh, our trade and investment uh, throughout the region. Uh, the recent visit from the Minister of Small Business and Export Promotion and International Trade, Mary Ng, uh, to South Africa, Kenya, and Ethiopia earlier this year is an example of uh, the most recent engagement. 
we want to build strong and effective partnerships to advance our shared priorities, including economic security, trade and economic growth, climate change, peace and security, and rule of law. Canada and Rwanda have long-standing relations dating back to Rwanda's independence. Canada has an accredited High Commissioner to Rwanda since 1967, uh, resident in Nairobi. Uh, but Canada also maintains an office of the High Commission in Kigali as well. And Global Affairs Trade Commissioner Service is also active in assisting Canadian companies doing business in Rwanda. Uh, the Trade Commissioner Service helps Canadian businesses grow by connecting them with international opportunities, funding and support programs, uh, and through our network of Trade Commissioners in over 160 cities worldwide. Uh, in, uh, in the specific case of my bureau here, we have um, a senior trade commissioner based here at headquarters, Claude Gendron, who I believe is on this call. Uh, he's the deputy director for commercial relations throughout the southern and eastern Africa region. In Nairobi, we have a senior trade commissioner in Nancy Bernard, who's the regional senior trade commissioner uh, covering Rwanda. And at our office in Kigali, of course, we have Marceline Mukaka Rangwa, who's trade commissioner at that office. And so all of these individuals are there and their, um, their primary purpose is to facilitate commercial relations between the two countries. So I would encourage you, um, if you have not um, been in touch with them, uh, to certainly establish ties to them. I think we've all been very encouraged uh, by uh, the high level engagement uh, that has been developing between Canada and, uh, and um, the continent uh, in, um, over the recent years, and especially in recent months. And uh, Rwanda has been a very big part of that. Uh, as many will know, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, visited um, uh, Addis Ababa and a number of other countries uh, and cities in Africa um, earlier this year on the margins of the Africa Union Summit in February. And he took that opportunity to meet with President Kagame um, uh, and uh, has had a number of exchanges with him since then. Um, and also our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister Champagne, has been engaging with his counterpart, Minister Biruta, in recent months as well. Um, and of course, Minister Champagne has also been engaging uh, with the former foreign minister, Louise Mushikiwabu, uh, in her current capacity as General Secretary of La Francophonie. Um, uh, so it, it really, we really have been um, happy to see these ties building. I think it helps to have that level of engagement uh, to appreciate uh, the opportunities that are there um, so that uh, there is support at the highest levels in both countries uh, for those uh, wishing to do business. Um, these ties go back further, of course, uh, last year in March of 2019, uh, the parliamentary, uh, Canada-Africa Parliamentary Association visited Kigali. And about a month later, our Governor General, um, uh, Julie Payette, also visited Kigali in the context of the 25th commemoration of the genocide against the Tutsi and had a very positive meeting with President Kagame at that time. So uh, certainly the high level uh, contacts and uh, momentum is there. Um, the cooperation that we have is uh, able to build upon some sound frameworks that have already been put in place to facilitate bilateral commercial relations. Uh, Canada and Rwanda have agreements in areas such as an agreement concerning insurance, sorry, investment assurance uh, that's been in place since 1980. There's an air transportation agreement uh, since 2011. Uh, there's an MOU on environmental cooperation in place since 2017. And we have certainly uh, also dis started discussions on a foreign investment uh, promotion and protection agreement, or FIPA. Um, as many of you will know, Rwanda ranks among the best places to do business in Sub-Saharan Africa, according to the World Bank ease of doing business uh, indicators. And I'm sure this is no surprise to uh, many of you who are online and certainly to Canadian companies uh, who are already doing business in Rwanda, such as SEMA International, Stevia Life, Desert Gold Ventures, Solomon Resources, Manitoba Hydro International, uh, just to name a few. 
In 2019, two-way bilateral merchandise trade between our countries amounted to $11.4 million, comprising $8.6 million in exports and $2.7 million in imports. Uh, so this is a, a, a very modest uh, starting point and definitely there's a, a sense that there's plenty of room to grow. Um, we see opportunities for Canadian companies in several sectors, including in education and in infrastructure services, extractive and energy sectors, to name a few. I'm happy to say that last year in June, Global Affairs Canada, in collaboration with the government of Quebec, organized a successful trade mission to Rwanda. There were five companies and organizations based in Quebec who were represented. And immediately following the mission, one participating ICT company from Montreal, Coloso Inc., opened an office in Kigali and signed an agreement with a local company, Tigersoft. Um, and we're happy to say that following on the success of that visit, um, a mission of Rwandan companies visited Montreal last year. So momentum is building and um, it's uh, wonderful to see this opportunity to have a, a webinar to try to build on that. Um, we are confident that this uh, will be a great opportunity to build on these um, uh, ties. And just to close on a personal note, I, I have to say that, um, you know, I uh, uh, was in Rwanda during some of its lowest moments uh, 26 years ago in 1994 and had the privilege of visiting again a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, the progress that Rwanda has made on the economic front, uh, the infrastructure front on the ease of doing business is absolutely spectacular. Uh, having uh, traveled and worked uh, uh, extensively in Africa over the last 20 years, uh, I can say firsthand that, uh, that uh, the level of organization, uh, the level of clarity around rules and regulations um, uh, was far above uh, many other countries that I uh, worked in before. And definitely uh, for any companies uh, seeking uh, to uh, initiate um, commercial relations in Africa uh, for the first time, uh, Rwanda is a wonderful starting point to consider. So I will stop there and uh, turn it back over to the chair. Thank you, Gareth. And thank you again for the invitation. Thank you, Director General Ian Miles. And what a wonderful context to sketch bilateral relations, but also the environment for doing business in Rwanda. And on that note, it is wonderfully appropriate to invite our keynote speaker for the session this, this morning across Canada, and for those of the continent this afternoon, Mr. Zephany Nyankuru, Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the Rwanda Development Board. He serves in the government of Rwanda's entity that is tasked to transform Rwanda into a global hub for business and innovation by fostering both an attractive investment environment, as well as an enabling regional and global export context for the creation of jobs and the growth of Rwanda's economy. Mr. Nyankuru holds a master's degree in finance focused on economic policy at the University of London. He's obtained a diploma in private sector development from the Swedish Institute of Public Administration and completed training in management of economic development zones in developing countries at the Jiangxi College of Foreign Studies in China. He holds a CFA Level 1 certificate and is a member of the CFA Institute. He has worked across a host of private and public sector projects and with development partners, and his full biography and details were circulated ahead of the meeting, but just to give a sense of the background of our keynote speaker today. He's also joined by members of his team in Kigali, and without further ado, it is my great privilege to welcome the keynote speaker of the Rwanda Investment Session, Mr. Zephanie Nyankuru. Thank you very much, uh, Gareth, for the warm welcome. Um, Excellency Ambassador Prosper, Ambassador to Canada, Sebastian Spio, Gabra, Chair of uh, the Board of uh, the Chamber, Mr. Ian Mills, Director General for Southern and uh, Eastern Africa, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning. And of course, good evening from uh, Chigari. It's a great pleasure to officiate this webinar that aims at, uh, to explore investment opportunities in Rwanda. I'd like to begin by extending uh, my sincere thanks to Mr. Sebastian, the chair of the board and his team for having organized 
this investment session on Rwanda. Uh, equally, I would like to also appreciate the efforts of uh, our ambassador for having coordinated this, and also our team and everyone else who was involved in making sure that this event happens. I'd also like to give a special welcome to our guests from uh, the private sector in Canada, um, whose presence and uh, insights are essential in these discussions that you want to venture into. I look forward to hearing your views uh, in this meeting, in this particular session where we'll be discussing investment opportunities. Distinguished participants, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, Rwanda and Canada have, have a long-term uh, diplomatic relation, and uh, I'm glad that Ian alluded to some of the concrete aspects that have been realized, you know, talking about all the diplomatic relations that that started back in 1963, and also um, to the specific interventions that happened post-1994, the um, side against the Chosin. Since at that time, Rwanda and Canada really experienced a gradual growth of relations and development cooperation, which are mainly tunneled uh, through multilateral organizations. Uh, recent years are uh, marked mainly by a shared commitment for both countries to strengthen bilateral relations and extend development cooperation. It is also uh, very important to acknowledge the recent visit by Governor uh, General His Excellency Right Honorable Yuri Payet um, um, in April 2019, which really demonstrated Canada's uh, commitment to preventing genocide and uh, formed the cordial relationship enjoyed between our two countries. Mr. Ian Alad alluded to also the recent visit of our Prime Minister in the region, including some specific discussions that focused on Rwanda. All of these have really been um, strengthening the cooperation and diplomatic relations between our two countries. Distinguished um, participants, ladies and gentlemen, today, Canada continues uh, to be a very important trade and uh, investment partner for Rwanda. Uh, Canadian businesses in the energy, tourism, manufacturing sectors are really playing a significant role in our economy as uh, long-term investors. Uh, but there is also definitely much more potentials and uh, joint ventures that can be explored, which is definitely the reason why we are here today. And thanks to Ian, who gave some specific examples in terms of some of the companies from Canada that have been doing business here, and also alluding to some of the sectors where more partnership would be um, 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 engaged. I certainly believe that this session will, will allow us to explore new areas of partnership and trade and investments. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, Rwanda. Um, has kept on working on improving investment climate. As uh, Ian mentioned, um, um, if you look into the ranking of the World Bank, we are the second in terms of uh, ease of doing business, second in Africa, uh, um, um, and we are ranked um, at rate around the world. And uh, if you look into how the economy has been performing, you know, the economy has really been stable. Over the last 10 years, we're talking about the GDP uh, growing on average by 8% every year. And uh, prior to the pandemic, if you look into the numbers from last year, uh, the, the, the average economic growth rate was uh, 9.4, including actually some um, couple of uh, quarters where we had a double digit growth. So the economy has really been growing. And uh, if you look into our national targets, we, we, we want to become a high income country by 2050, not so by 20. 35 uh, B in the brackets of higher middle income country where the GDP per capita will be around 4,000 USD. We're not going to be able to achieve uh, this critical mission without the participation of the private sector, bringing in the required uh, investments, um, foreign direct investments from investors like uh, Canadian or companies from other parts of the world that are based in Canada that might want to expand their business and come to Rwanda because these companies 
create jobs for Rwandans or other residents in Rwanda. These companies will bring in the know-how, the technology, and also um, they be um, keep on making sure that we keep on increasing on the overall output and also improving on the overall productivity. And uh, this, of course, requires command efforts of uh, government, private sector, and uh, development partners. Um, it's only fair to say that uh, if we stay focused, uh, think big, work hard, uh, you know, we're gonna tie, attain this and even uh, achieve more. Um, for, for, for the couple of years, government has been focusing on uh, establishing a conducive business environment. And uh, those are really the results that have led us to having this conducive environment. Currently, if you want to start a, a company or to open a business, you know, you don't need to be here. You can do it online. It's gonna take you six hours. And uh, we've been doing or making all of these reforms to make sure that we facilitate members of the private sector to come and operate in Rwanda. Philip will be coming back in, uh, to details pertaining to this, but I wanted to highlight and stress out some of these interventions that the government has been bringing on board. And we keep definitely accelerating um, uh, investment across different areas, including ICT, infrastructure, mining, and also services. And uh, today, we want to, to give you really a flavor of the investment opportunities uh, that exist in our country. And we hope that uh, this is going to be um, a continuation of uh, the activities that have been working on, some of the investments that have been going on, as uh, Mr. Ian alluded to them and also as our ambassador mentioned. And, um, you know, it's a beginning, it's a continuation. We're gonna have more, you know, discussions or conversation around this and hope to be able to see specific deals being concluded from this particular session. Let me conclude by thanking the organizers of this business session and uh, look forward to fruitful discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I believe Mr. Philip Lucky will be providing a presentation deck. Uh, it's been a great privilege to engage with you, sir, uh, in these weeks leading up to this event today. And I uh, welcome you to the session formally. Thank you very much, uh, Garrett, uh, for giving us the opportunity to really uh, be part of this webinar session. And of course, to, to the esteemed uh, executive management of the board, Mr. Sebastian, uh, Mr. Ian Mills, thank you very much for involving us and for really inviting us to, to involve and engage uh, with the Canadian, Canadian private sector. Again, my job is very, very simple at this webinar. Uh, I'm going to make a very uh, a detailed presentation. Uh, the deputy CEO has pretty much uh, shared uh, specific areas, but uh, from from this presentation, at least people will be able to see visually some of the areas that we are currently championing as a, uh, because as a country, we're really trying to see how we can attract more uh, value added uh, businesses, but even investments into our country. So if you allow, I'm going to present, I'm going to Can you see the presentation? We can, sir. Thank you. Yes. So again, uh, it's all very, very important to give you a flavor of what Rwanda has to offer today. And um, it's also very, very imperative to understand um, who we are as a country. I'm sure the participants on this webinar probably know Rwanda from a different angle based on the history that we went through. But after the 26 years, you know, after the genocide against the Tutsi, our country has been very, very resilient, uh, very proactive, in trying to change uh, you know, the perception, but also trying to build a very resilient population, the economy, for us to be able to uh, have a very strong um, standing point. And so this slide, uh, the first slide is basically to give you a sneak peek of our country. We're a very small country of around 26,338 square kilometers uh, with a population size of around 12.6 million. Now, for people who are on this webinar, it's also very imperative for you to understand that Rwanda perhaps is um, among uh, the 53 countries in Africa. We have a population that is able to speak over four languages. 
you know, Kinyarwanda being our national dialect, we also uh, have a population that is very much gifted to speaking at least three official languages. You know, with French, uh, again, Mr. Ian uh, Miles mentioned that we're part of the Francophonie fraternity. So French is one of the languages that is commonly used in Rwanda. English and Swahili are the other additional official languages that are used in our country as official languages. And of course, we've also seen a very um, uh, significant numbers in terms of how unemployment has been dropping over the years. And today we're almost at 15%. And of course, with COVID, there might be a slight change on that, but it's too early to tell. But again, as a country, we're very resilient, and our goal is to promote and attract more investments that can create new opportunities uh, of jobs for population. Now, going to the other slide, uh, it's also um, very imperative to really give you a flavor of where we were and where we are today. Of course, uh, everyone knows that Rwanda has really emerged from a very difficult history in which we lost over a million lives during the 1994 uh, genocide against the Tutsi. And of course, from this very devastating situation, the leadership of our country uh, made deliberate and often very uh, difficult decisions to forge unity, but also on reconciliation and begin the long process of reconstructing our nation. And so because of that, we had really to make to undertake very bold and major transformation across the entire economy, be it from education in health, macroeconomic stability, innovation, governance, safety. And because of that, we've also seen uh, these changes result into um, tangible outputs. And so because of this, Rwanda has been you know, ranked in several ways uh, with the second fastest growing economy in Africa. In fact, last year alone, our economy grew at 9.4%, and we saw um, a growth in major sectors lead, uh, leading to this growth. Services, of course, taking lead. We had um, industry that also uh, grew at around 17%, and of course, agriculture at 24%. But the other thing is, um, of course, based on our history, we value security a lot. We know what it means to be a very safe and secure country. And of course, for any investor to be able to come and do business in the country, the first um, parameter they'll look at is the safeness of the country. And so today, we ranked actually the fifth safest country at work at night worldwide. Uh, on top of that is that um, in ease of doing business, I'm sure many people here know that the World Bank every day does a survey to really ascertain um, the process but also uh, the policies that are in place to be able to facilitate businesses to establish. And because of that, uh, last year we we're ranked the second easiest place to do business in Africa and 38th in the world. And so Rwanda is actually among the top, is uh, the only low income country in the top 50 uh, to make to that rank. Then the other thing really is around creating an enabling environment, you know, we're trying to position ourselves as a hub in the region. And of course, for us to achieve that, there's a lot of effort that requires it to happen. One, uh, we've invested in a national airline, which means if you want to really come and travel in Rwanda, it's easier for you to just buy a ticket and, and embark on that flight without necessarily going through our embassy uh, to get a visa. But the other thing is really, uh, you know, building um, very strong infrastructure. When it comes to ICT, I think our government has been very, very instrumental in laying the backbone to make sure that at least the whole country is connected to internet. Now, uh, Gareth, please confirm that the slides are moving. The slides are moving, yes sir. Okay, thank you very much. And, and you can do full screen, eh? I oh, think okay. if you do full screen, that will be very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Is that okay? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So the other thing, Gareth, is um, is really creating a very enabling environment for the, for business to thrive. This slide is basically to give you a flavor on some of the key uh, uh, basic services and incentives that investors can actually uh, enjoy when they register the investments uh, with RDB. So. If you look again at what our investment law currently provides, we have a preferential corporate income tax. Uh, if a company is able at least to export 50% of, of their production. And of course, this comes along with the value addition because what we're trying to do is really to have 
an export-oriented economy. And for that to happen, then we must have attractive incentives. And so if you're someone who's going to set up a factory, you know, construction materials, agro-processed products, then you can actually benefit from this 15% CIT reduction. Then the others is around 50% uh, investment allowance for, uh, in the first year of operation. But the other thing is that we also have, Rwanda being a member of the South African community, we also have what we call a common external tariff, which literally applies to goods coming from outside the East African community. So if you're an investor and you're going to set up your factory, and probably uh, in your plans you have, you know, you're going to bring machines and raw materials, uh, the current regime provides for 0% import duty. So if you're going to import uh, machines, raw materials, you pay 0%. With semi-finished goods, you pay 10%, uh, and then finished goods is 25%. And this is, uh, you know, a tariff that applies to all the other partner states. It's not just for Rwanda. So if you're going to do business in any of these countries, the same tariff would apply. And maybe the other thing that I also want to highlight, as the DCO mentioned, uh, Gareth and the team uh, guests on this uh, webinar, is that it's easier for you to set up your business. RDB being a one-stop center uh, for doing business in Rwanda, we've tried as much as possible to make life easy for investors, which means if you want to register your company, it takes you less than six hours for you to incorporate your business. In addition to that, you do not have any restrictions tied for you to register your business. I understand that in some other countries, they always want, they all, their preference is always to have a local shareholder. But for Rwanda, that's not the, the case. So you can own the company 100%. And then lastly, you may opt to choose uh, um, the structure under which your company would operate whether it's a domestic company or, um, or a foreign branch. But there is no difference on that. And of course, the other thing is uh, we do not have any restrictions on ownership. You can own land in Rwanda 100%, and you can also repatriate your profits for as long as you meet your tax obligations. I'll try to be very, very, very fast. I know that some of these areas have already been touched. And in the interest of time, I'll try to uh, focus on, on the key important slides. Now, this slide is, is to also give you at least a sneak peek of where we stand today in terms of uh, market accessibility. Um, of course, being a population of 12.6 is something that will probably not resonate with so many investors uh, because business can only thrive when you have a bigger market. But uh, for the audience on this, uh, um, on this webinar, I want to inform you that Rwanda being of the East African community gives you a very strong access to the other partner states where, uh, of, you know, the other partner states that are members of the East African community. We have Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, and, and South Sudan. So if you happen to do business in Rwanda, you can easily access any of these markets without any uh, conditions attached. We have a common market protocol. We have a customs union, so you can easily trade and do investment across the region. And of course, the other is the common market for Eastern Southern Africa, where Rwanda is also a member. And so because of this, if you set up your business in Rwanda, then you're able to at least access a population of over 500 uh, million. But the other thing is also to um, give you at least an understanding of some of the proximity markets that we have as a country. You know, being at the center of Africa also gives us a very strong leverage in accessing some of the markets that are probably either served not efficiently, but also probably their virgin markets, if I would probably use the word. So the Eastern DRC that part, the Eastern DRC is, is very close to Rwanda, and that gives us a very, very strong leverage in terms of serving this market uh, even better. It has a population of around uh, 12 uh, million. That's the close, closest proximity. And so what we are doing is really to encourage uh, investment in some of the secondary cities that are very close to, um, to, 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 to DRC. And of course, when I talk DRC, the most closest cities that we're talking about is Bukavu, which is very close to Rusizi, and then Goma, which is very close to, to, to Rwavu. Then in terms of accessibility, again, it's also very, very imperative to highlight that if you want to travel to Rwanda, I think Rwanda is probably one of the easiest countries to travel to in the world. Given the fact that one, we have a universal visa regime, which means if you want to come to Rwanda, you don't need to go to an embassy in Ottawa. 
it's just a matter of you know buying a ticket and then get back on the flight and to even make the process more easier we've even waived visa fees for nationals um if you're national coming from either you know the francophonie fraternity the au or the commonwealth the first 30 days of your visit in rwanda are, pro, are, are free of charge so which means the with the visa fees are waived actually and then after the 30 days you can opt to extend and then you pay uh, a single entry visa or a fee of, of 30 dollars or 50 dollars rather now going to the specifics uh, i'll try to be very very fast uh, in the interest in the interest of time um gareth uh, and the esteemed uh, audience on this um, webinar it's very very imperative to understand that there are several sectors that we are marked as strategic and important to drive our economic transformation to another level we are uh, the dco earlier mentioned of the key visions that we've put in place the vision 2035 and 2050 for us to achieve the you know remarkable growth within uh, those two visions the specific areas that we've actually earmarked and of course ict being one of them so ICT is one of the key uh, fastest growing sectors uh, in our country. And if you look at the investment that our, that our government has made, it's quite significant, both from the infrastructure perspective, but even from, from the investment perspective. And so laying that backbone is, a, uh, an, is, a, is, a, is one of the strongest areas that government is trying to build strength to make sure that if any investors want to come and do business in Rwanda, it becomes easier for them to, to set up. So, um, and, and if I can go to the specific uh, opportunities that we're currently promoting, Rwanda is currently positioning itself as a proof of concept destination. So we have this concept of starting Rwanda, where if a company has a, a concept to develop, how do we make sure that we work with you to make sure that that concept actually becomes a reality? And we have very, very good examples of this. One is Zipline. I'm sure everyone on this uh, webinar knows Zipline. It's, um, it's a drone company that actually developed their concept in Rwanda, started in Rwanda, and today they're expanding to other countries, including the US where they came from. Today, it's one of the fastest growing companies delivering blood using drones. And we're now seeing the company actually expanding their services to other countries such as Ghana, We've seen them, you know, provide services in North Carolina, the U.S. and California, and now looking to expand to, to Ethiopia and, 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 in, and in Asia as well. And of course, the other companies that we have within this line is uh, Volkswagen that developed um, a custom-made uh, mobility solution, a customized uh, mobility solution for Rwanda. They set up a car assembling plant, but they also found an opportunity to do a mobility um, solu a solution that is very much customized uh, for our market. And today they're actually expanding that uh, service to, to other countries, uh, including uh, Ghana and, and, and Ethiopia as well. Now, going to the opportunities, um, ladies and gentlemen, um, one of the key areas that we are currently promoting um, uh, and seeking for FDI is the Kigali Innovation City. This is one of the flagship projects uh, that is designed really to accelerate the development of Rwanda's ICT, but also transforming uh, our country into a knowledge-based economy. And of course, uh, government has really prioritized uh, this project. And because of that, we have marked 61.3 hectares of land within the Kigali Special Economic Zone. And the whole idea of having this uh, city is really to facilitate the growth of startups, but also have investments that can be within one place to be able to complement on each other. So if you look at products such as ICT training centers, centers of excellence, you know, uh, software build and test labs, all these need to be very much close to each other. And of course, the other significant component of this investment is in real estate. If an IT uh, firm wants to come and set up in Rwanda, how do you make it easy for them? be able to locate uh, into uh, this ecosystem. And so this is a project that we're currently focusing on and promoting to be able to bring uh, top-notch companies into the city. Uh, then the others, uh, we have the Innovation Fund, which is also another key significant area. 
Uh, this is a 100 million fund that is set to spur the development of world-class innovative entrepreneurs, but also enabling technology in the ICT sector within Rwanda. The fund is, is anchored by the government of Rwanda that has secured 30 million in funding, and it's privately managed uh, by a firm called Angaza. And so we are now seeking for 70 million from private investors for us to be able to kickstart this uh, fund. The fund is designed to support uh, startups, as I mentioned earlier, and tech-enabled sectors. And when I mention the tech-enabled sectors, we have specific areas. We're looking at smart transport. We're looking at e-commerce. We're looking at agri-tech, digital health, as well as, uh, as fintech. So another area that I would want us to, to really focus on is manufacturing which is probably one of the fastest growing sectors of our economy. Uh, we know that today for any uh, emerging economy to thrive, it should have a very strong base. And of course, manufacturing being one of those. And if you look at the current situation with the manufacturing sector, it is really, uh, it's steadily growing, if I would say. Uh, I think in 2017, 2018, it grew on almost an average of 8% in, the, in, the, in that fiscal year. And, and so for us to be able to address all the loopholes, for us to be able to bridge up the gaps that we have, especially when it comes to the trade deficit, how do we develop opportunities that we believe will address some of the challenges that we have on our market? And so for us to be able to do that, we've outlined key areas uh, or key uh, products that we think will add value to our economy, both from the, sub, the, sub, uh, from the demand side, as well as from the, from the export side. So if you look at, for example, light manufacturing, we earmarked key, key, key subsectors, electronics. Today, we already have some companies that are producing electronics in Rwanda. We have Mara phones, but the question would be, is Mara phones enough for, you know, to produce enough phones for the market? Vehicles, you know, we already have Volkswagen that is assembling in Rwanda. But the question is now that we have a very bigger market, is Volkswagen, um, enough to supply uh, the regional market. We have the continental free trade area, which is already going to be taking effect in January next year. So if you want to have a one common market, definitely this is a very great opportunity for you to come and seize on this opportunity. When it comes to pharmaceutical products, e-mobility, garments, textile and garments, we have several companies that are already producing for the market, but it's not enough. And our target is really to have so many textile and garment uh, companies that can produce to the market, but also export um, to, to countries such as uh, Canada as well as, as EU. When it comes to construction materials, of course, we see that our construction industry is, is really growing very fast. And as a result, there's a very significant demand for construction materials. Key, key construction materials that are highly demanded. Things such as ceramics and glass. Today we import a lot a lot, a lot of ceramics. Probably the biggest import bill that we spend on is on ceramics and glass, because these are not produced here in the country. Cement, metals and, pl and plastics, as well as natural construction materials. And of course, for any investor to be able to set up in Rwanda, the first question would be, if I come to Rwanda, how am I going to set up? Where am I going to locate my industry? Where am I going to set up my factory? And so for us to make it easier for you to set up your factory, We've earmarked several, several uh, projects. We have the Kigali Special Economic Zone, uh, which is a state of the art with all the necessary infrastructures in place for us to be able to, uh, to make it easy for the investors to set up their factories within the zone. Fully serviced with all the necessary infrastructures. You know, it's connected with, you know, tarmac roads, electricity, we have a sewer system. And because of the, of the high demand, we're now actually expanding to phase three. Phase one and phase two, I would say, are fully completed and, and fully covered. And so because of the demand, we're now expanding to, to, to phase three. And the other advantage is that the current arrangement is that if you're coming set up in the zone, you don't need to really um, pay for the land 100%. We put in arrangements that can actually allow you to pay for the land for a period of time to be able to make, you know, allow you to, to set up uh, uh, so easily. We have a subsidized float rate. We have a 30% down payment, but also we give you a two year grace period for you to pay for the land. 
but with an interest rate of around 15%. Now, if I go to the last, last sector, if you allow, in the interest of time uh, is mining. We all know that Canada is probably one of the, among the top countries for having the best, best mining um, uh, uh, business activities, but at the same time, the technology. And so it's also very important for the audience here to understand um, the plans that our country has uh, for us to be able to develop the sector. So if you look at our mining sector today, it's the second largest export sector in the Rwandan economy after tourism. And of course, the sector has untapped potential investment opportunities that we're trying to promote and be able to uh, attract more value added uh, FDI. Today, if you look at in terms of export uh, revenues, I think last year we almost generated around 347 million uh, from the sector. And our target is really to increase that to 1.5 billion by 2024. Now, the opportunities that we have um, around value addition, you know, Rwanda's mineral, uh, minerals ores produced in the country are exported as you know, raw mineral concentrates, not as metals. So we're looking at really establishing processing centers to smelt, for example, cassette rate in two tins, uh, you know, refining um, oil from it in two tungsten uh, and, two, and, and, and tantalum, as well as uh, cut, cut, gemstone cutting and polishing. So this is a very, very, very pertinent area. We already have some companies around two, three companies, very large, but the question is, are these enough really to, 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 um, to process this? So that in itself presents a very uh, a big opportunity. And then lastly is really around industrial mining. Uh, currently, Rwanda's mining sector is mostly artisanal in nature. And so because of that, modern technology is really needed to upgrade the sector to semi-mechanized and later at industrial level to increase production, but also um, to be able to at least uh, bring in uh, equipment that can help us to, you know, uh, change uh, that uh, that area. So we need more bulldozers, drillers, gravity table shakers for us to be able to, to grow the sector to another level. So with that, really, I come to the end of my presentation and uh, I'll be very happy to take any questions from the audience. And again, as the deputy CEO mentioned, uh, RDD is always very much open to investors. We're here to work with you, to facilitate you, to give you the information that you need if you need a strategic partner in Rwanda, how do we make it easy for you to be able to link you up with that partner that you're seeking to work with? But the other aspect is also to, to give you all the necessary information that you can actually uh, use to develop a business proposal uh, for us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for a fantastic presentation and this portfolio of investment opportunities. Uh, we've got several questions coming through on our WhatsApp line as well as through the chats. Uh, the first question relates to uh, noting that Rwanda is an excellent gateway and soft landing. And uh, Lucia Kalinda adds to that, uh, Lucia Kalinda adds to that, where do you see Rwandan and Canadian business owners, perhaps this speaks to the diaspora, getting involved in building partnerships with Canadian businesses here and then connecting back to Rwanda with these joint uh, partnerships. Any thoughts on that role of the diaspora in particular? Yes. And I think, um, thank you. Yes, definitely uh, the diaspora is, um, is um, one of uh, the major areas that we look at when it comes to you know, getting not only Rwanda and so outside the rest of Rwanda, but also uh, other people who are in the connection or in the community of, 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 of the Rwandans and the diaspora to invest in Rwanda. So the, we, we have quite a number of uh, forum, including a desk in our Minister of Foreign Affairs, where we've been engaging members of the diaspora uh, to show them some of the investment opportunities that they can invest in, and also to make sure that they are facilitated when it comes to investing money in, in Rwanda or to invest back home. Um, of course, the major point of entry is, uh, is our embassy. And, uh, I think Ambassador will probably need to even to supplement some of these points. 
Um, but um, we, we are really strengthening these uh, kind of channels, working with uh, our Minister of Foreign Affairs to organize mass sessions so that uh, members of the diaspora who wants to invest in Rwanda can invest. And also they, they, they get facilitated in terms of either sending their money for investments, but also if they need to be linking them with um, local service providers who can live in terms of following up on their businesses. Thank you very much. Uh, we've also got a question around agriculture. If there's any specific information that could be shared, and of course, this goes uh, for everyone on the call. If, if you would like to email me directly, I'd be also very happy to help facilitate in coordination with our wonderful panel, as well as that includes Global Affairs Canada, who've got support for the Canadian businesses and investors. Um, but any specific thoughts on, on agriculture or, and any major potential projects there? And that is uh, from one of the questions we've received. Yes, we do, uh, Gareth. We have, unfortunately, because of time, I had to uh, bridge my, to shorten my presentation. But yes, we do have uh, several projects and opportunities within the agriculture sector. And uh, specifically, we have uh, two uh, major projects. Uh, one is Gaviro Agribusiness Hub, uh, which is um, an irrigation project uh, that government of Rwanda is I think we may have lost you. Uh, I think I think we to have to uh, yes, for we, today. And the whole idea of having this project. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear yes, me? you are Thank back. You. Go ahead. Sorry uh, for the network. I was saying that we have two very important projects that I will probably have shared in the slides that will be worth sharing with the audience here. And one is really the Agri Business Ag Gaviro Agri Business Hub project. Um, which is a fully commercial oriented farming project that was, that was initiated through a joint venture between the government of Rwanda and Netafim. And the whole purpose of this project really is to leapfrog the development of agriculture, but also ensuring food security. So the whole purpose, again, is really to having uh, private sector investment, invest in, you know, uh, in um, growing high value crops. But at the same time, we also want to um, increase uh, the, produ the uh, production of, of key agricultural commodities uh, for the local market, but also targeting the export market. So if you look at the size of where this project is going to be located, it's 15,600 hectares. And of course, that project won't be developed upfront. We're trying to, we're going to develop it in phases, you know, of 200 blocks, and the first phase will cover around 5,600 hectares. So I'll be sharing with you all this information in the slides for the, at least the audience to come, you know, have time and read through. And then if there are any specific questions, then we can always uh, address those uh, even after the session. Fantastic, thank you very much. And we've received a number of requests on the WhatsApp line and on email for the presentation for investors to study these in more detail. Uh, so thank you very much. It's incredibly comprehensive. Thank you. Hey, a question, uh, and it's a broader question around some of what was highlighted by Director General Ian Miles observing the ease of doing business and governance in Rwanda uh, around uh, investment and, and management. Any thoughts on the uh, successes identified around managing COVID and how that is going to be continuing amidst concerns around second waves in several countries? Um, just any reflections on how it is that Botswana managed to get to this point of opening for business ahead of uh, several markets around the world? Um, you know, correct. Uh, um, there have been um, quite a number of initiatives that uh, have been going on in Rwanda, especially you know, when it comes to containing the spread or to curbing the spread of COVID-19. Um, um, uh, we, we, some, the strategy that we really used was um, more of attacking it or imposing strict measures way, way, way before. If I can give, um, for example, some key data. The first case, uh, the first positive case was recorded on uh, March 14th. That's when we, 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 you know, we had a confirmation of the first positive case. But six days later, we had a full, that's when we started a full total lockdown. So we closed the economy, we closed the borders 
to make sure that we do effective contact tracing, we do effective um, uh, uh, intervention that would help us to make sure that any person who was in contact with that positive case could be identified and then isolated. So, so, so really the first thing which I think um, helped us to record a small number of, uh, of death was uh, that aspect of starting way early, that's number one. And then number two, having strong team which has been working on contract tracing and also doing all of these isolation related uh, interventions. And then um, another third component also was um, you know, our, the way our leadership has been taking this as a, you know, as a top, top, top priority. If I give an example, uh, since this pandemic started, our cabinet meets every two weeks, including several task force meetings that happen for and to assist each and every situation to see if some of the sec sections of the economy could be reopened, you know, gradually or closed. So all of these efforts are really the ones that helped us to be where we are today. So, so far we've recorded less than 20 deaths since the, the pandemic started. But also if you look into the number of our people, if you look at the total number of the population, we are talking about a population of 11 million people. So far the tests that we have conducted are around 500,000, almost a half, half million. So being able to test more people, being able to isolate people, being able uh, uh, to impose prevention measures way before was really one of the major weapons that helped us to curb the situation, uh, to, curb, to curb the spread. But of course, um, same as other parts of the world, there have been you know, ups and downs. I think when the, the, the pandemic started, everyone believed that it's something that's going to disappear as the summer would be starting. But we are now in September, we are still talking about cases and so forth. But really those early interventions and then continuous strict contact tracing, isolation are the measures that helped us. And when we were also going to open up our airport again on August 1st, we had started working way, way before on measures which would help us to open up safely. And in the end, um, we were able even to get uh, the, the stamp of the World Trade Travel to Tourism and Travel Council in terms, in terms of safe travel stamp. So these measures really that were taken early, you know, took us where we are today. But of course, it's a pandemic. We still adhere to the measures, including making sure that uh, everyone puts on a mask, making sure that uh, at the office people use a minimum number of people, others work remotely, making sure that uh, people keep social distancing and also continue enforcing the measures that we talked about. But still, we have quite a number of sections of the economy that are still closed. You know, schools are yet to open. Uh, some of business entities, like the ones that are involved in the casino, gaming, um, gym, spa, swimming, all of these are still closed. But uh, also another um, a big section of the economy is open, including international travels. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got a number of uh, uh, notes here that people will be following up with private, uh, more detailed questions, which we'll be facilitating, of course. But there is one remaining open question on the chat, and it comes from Mr. Jacques Mumtumbe, who's been to Rwanda, is a big fan. He's uh, with us here at the chamber as a vice president, but he's also founder of the African, uh, Africa Investment Foresight Group, or Africa Foresight Investment Group, as a co-founder. When it comes to investment, Shark asks, he notes most of the time investors from Canada require local participation aside from only land. If an investor is interested in providing 80%, 80% of total capital of a project, can Rwanda come up with 20%? Local participation, says Jacques, is helpful to raise multilateral debt commitments. Uh, any, any thoughts on, on that sort of detailed structure? Can Rwanda provide a percentage, in this case 20, let's say, of the, and, and Canada provides 80%? Good question. Well, uh, as Philip mentioned, number one, we don't have restrictions. Yeah. Of course, there are some countries where you're going to go and they tell you, you know, with the, the local content, the local partnership is a must. If you want to start a company, make sure you get a local partner. And I hope we also have a liquidity stake in that particular company. But for Rwanda, it's open. 
So you can either go solo, you can have 100% of ownership or 100% of ownership can be foreign. You also have a second option, of course, for locals, if you want to, can also be 100% owned by domestic investors. And then there is a third option where you can do partnership, local and international. And then you also have a fourth option where if you are an FDI or if you are a private sector investor, you can partner with the government. So the question he asked it is, you know, can you secure 20%? You can even secure more than that. Depending on the kind of business, we can help you, for example, to get some of the local partners that might be interested to partner with you. If you also want to go alone, that's fine. Also, depending with the sector, if it's something where the government can co-invest with you, the government can invest with you again. So it really depends with the, the nature of the business, but all of those structures are possible. For the side of government, you can go into a joint venture with the government where you can have a certain number of shares and the government is going to have certain, uh, another number of shares. If, if there need be, you can enter into a kind of a concession agreement with the government. You know, you give your concession for quite a number of years, then you'll be paying a certain fee pertaining to that particular concession. If you're talking about sectors like energy, it can be a power purchasing agreement or concession agreement that you enter into with the government. So it's really going to depend with the structure that you need. But the answer to that question is yes. If you believe that that's what's going to help you to raise money, we can really help you to look for local partners who can partner with you, especially through our, the private sector federation, which brings together the business community from Rwanda. Thank you very much. Uh, and a lot of wonderful responses um, in, in reaction to what you've just outlined. Uh, very, very favorable. Uh, thank you. And congratulations once again on the incredible economic and ease of doing business metrics that have been achieved. We are delighted as the Canada Africa Chamber of Business to have Rwanda as a member of the organization and very keen to ensure that we move to active investment as a result of this session that we've held today. It is my great privilege at this point as we come to the close uh, to invite, should they wish to offer a final word, His Excellency and or Mr. Sebastian Spear Garber, Chair of the Board, uh, to close this session. And I commend each of them for their leadership in ensuring that we're gathered together today across Rwanda and across Canada, continuing to do business and certainly looking forward to being in Rwanda on the ground very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gareth. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you, uh, brothers uh, from, from Rwanda. Um, it's, it's a real great privilege uh, to have had uh, this excellent presentation. And we do hope uh, that uh, in the year ahead, we'll be able to really uh, bring a trade mission uh, to Rwanda again. Thank you so much, uh, very much um, again. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And thank you once again as well uh, to Your Excellency and to all the leadership to Global Affairs Canada who've joined us as well and their keen commitment to supporting the Canadian companies. And uh, if there are no final words in that regard, uh, I would like to once again say a big thank you. This is not the end, but simply phase one in what will be a long bond and series of trade and investment deals. Of that, we are certainly very certain. Thank you once again and have a wonderful evening in Rwanda and a great rest of the afternoon to each of you across Canada. Bye-bye. Thank you.